Ladies and gentlemen, welcome back to the number one sports podcast on the planet. I'm your host, Drake Tharp, and we are in to the midst of July. Uh, free agency just about over. Kevin Durant still has not been traded. Uh, Kyrie Irving still has not been traded. Donovan Mitchell, potential landing spots upcoming. Um, yeah, so we're in the boring time of sports. It sucks. All we got is baseball, free agency. We get to talk a lot. We get to speculate. And I'm going to jump into something right away and be a homer for a second. We're going to talk about my Chicago Bears. Skip Bayless gets to talk about his Cowboys. Stephen A. Smith gets to talk about his stupid Knicks. Um, who, Colin Coward gets to talk about his South California teams that he beloves so much for any reason. I'm going to talk about this subjective opinion that the entire NFL media loves to have about the Chicago Bears, and that's their wide receiver room. Okay, the NFL media freaking fans around the world love to have this narrative that the Chicago Bears have the worst wide receiver room in the NFL. And just thinking to myself, just casually, I can think of five teams that have a worse wide receiver room. Maybe even 10. Maybe even 10 if we can argue. Uh, but there, yeah, there's at least a numerous amount of teams with worse wide receiver rooms than Chicago. And gets and Chicago gets the social media backlash every day, okay? This laughing stock has to stop at some point because why do other teams get to have, you know, their chance at a rebuild and the Bears don't? This is what I don't understand. They're... they're the Bears have been more successful than the average NFL team. Let's be real here. Um, there are plenty of other teams rebuilding. I don't understand, you know, Chicago has a proven guy at their wide receiver one spot. A lot of other teams like Green Bay, Kansas City, New England, Tennessee, Atlanta, Jacksonville, Giants, uh, Baltimore, all those teams do not have a proven one. Okay, you make you could make the argument for a few there, but nine times out of ten, I'm taking Darnell Mooney over any of those guys. Okay, they've made... Uh, a draft pick in the third round for Vellis Jones, proven Tennessee player. Um, Byron Pringle, who put up great numbers for the Chiefs at the three spot. I, I get it. Tyree Kill and Travis Kelsey probably got him open a lot, but he has to do something right route running wise. Okay. Um, New England, uh, name a guy, Jacoby Myers. Okay. You know, I know it's scheme over there. Green Bay, Rodgers will make him good. But at the same time, talent wise, wide receiver talent wise, the kid from North Dakota State's their number one right now. What has he proven? Nothing. So the moves that the Bears have made may have been questionable, but there's other spots to fill than the wide receiver room. There was blown coverage all season. They fixed that in the draft. Offensive line, they drafted about four of them. Later rounds, one of them ought to be good. You'd think so, right? I would take a guess and say that at least 40% of the starting offensive linemen in the NFL are third-round picks or later. I'm just going to take a guess here. 40%, I'll take that any day. Okay, so this little narrative that the Bears have the worst wide receiver room in the league and that it's a laughing stock per se, there's other groups and elements to a team here, okay? And this is me being a homer, okay? I don't understand why, you know, all these faves, these fave teams can, you know, have their little rebuild go uh, swimmingly like Jacksonville, Detroit, um, Atlanta right now. They're all going through rebuilds. No one gets backlash. They all just get, you know, pondered off and they're... They're, you know, teams have been irrelevant for 20 years at this point, okay? So, <laughs> if we went on a laughing stock, let's take a look at those teams and, you know, laugh at them. At least the Bears, you know, are kind of known for something. Excuse me for being a homer, okay? This is, a, this is being a fan page right now. This is being, you know, I'm letting my bias come off, but I'm sick of it, okay? And if as an analyst, as somebody who looks at the media every day, there's bias towards the Bears. So yes, I'm going to come to their defense if this little narrative that their wide receiver room is bottom three, bottom five. It's stupid. They have a proven guy. There's at least 10 teams that have their wide receiver one without a proven guy. I can go through them again if you want. If you want to argue in the comments, let's freaking go because I'm sick of it. I almost tossed my phone out the freaking window of you know, just reading, just reading on Twitter, and it was making me so mad, okay, so I had to address it, um, well, all these teams get to have their rebuilds, no, no one talks about them, they're like, okay, we'll let them have it, you know, they're rebuilding, when the Bears rebuild, no, the, you know, it's a laughing stock, it's because, you know, they're so used to, you know, defensive dominance every year, I don't know what it is, I don't know, maybe it's getting fans like me riled up, that's probably what it is, but, I've not seen any backlash towards any other team, uh, you know, regarding any group that is struggling on their behalf. Um, 
you know, Detroit gets to have their rebuild. Like I said, Jacksonville's rebuilding. New York, the Jets, they get to have theirs. No one's, I mean, the Jets do cut, get a lot of slack just because of the New York thing. But all these other teams, they get to have, you know, a quiet, pleasant, you know, rebuild without social media backlash. And it makes me upset. So this needs to end. If you want to argue in the comments over who has a better wide receiver room, I will. I can name teams out the hatch. We can do this in the comments. We'll write. We'll talk. But I just wanted to get that out of the way. I'm going to – sorry. If Skip Bayless can defend his Cowboys every which week without, you know, winning a playoff game in 20 years, I can talk about my Bears. Excuse me. All right, let's cool down. I'm a little red if you can't tell. I got in the sun today. I got a little sunburn. I'm not red because I'm angry. I'm not. I'm, there's no fumes coming out my head or anything. I just got. I just got some sun action, and I don't know if it dawned on me that I need to get on and you know spout some you know Chicago Bears love and hate towards the critics. But anywho, we're gonna jump to our summer league spotlight. Keegan Murray, the Iowa stud. Keegan Murray dropped a summer league high, 29 points. Seven rebounds, four steals, and two assists in a loss against the Knicks in a loss. But this guy is scoring. He's doing. He's playing amazing defense. He's putting up boards. Uh, this is this guy is looking like an all-around scoring stud, if, uh, to say the least. Okay, to compliment De'Aaron Fox and Demontis Sabonis, uh, this provides the Kings with everything from scoring to defensive presence. Okay, if you're a Kings fan, I'd be insanely happy with this pick. I think I saw. Uh, a read earlier this week that most scouts actually had Keegan Murray at number two on their big board list rather than number four. Um, a lot of scouts were very high on Keegan Murray. It wasn't uh, it wasn't a notable you know talking point that he'd be a top three pick, but he's playing out of his mind right now. He'll complement Sabonis and Fox well with his ability to score, and he's also distributing well. Uh, he's playing good defense. He's looking like an all-around, you know, just scoring stud at the forward position. I think that's what they need. Sabonis so has a lot of distributing. Fox is a scoring guard. Uh, there's a lot of guys who can do it all for the Kings right now, and I think their rebuild is going swimmingly. So if you're a Kings fan, look bright in the future. That is your Summer League Spotlight. Keegan Murray, that is it for the week on Summer League Spotlight. That's the, uh, that's the, that's the name I'm calling it, Summer League Spotlight. Uh, SLS, you know, I, I don't know. We'll add an acronym in there. I think it's cool. Anywho, uh, speaking of the summer league, uh, I was having a discussion uh, with a with a peer of mine at work, and you know the talk came up. Okay, summer league team. What do you have on that team? You have probably you know college players, you know who are probably the best on their team, uh, guys who made it out, um, but didn't get drafted. Maybe you know a few guys, guys who got drafted, guys who didn't get drafted. Players fighting for a roster spot, essentially. Okay. Now, when you discuss the college basketball and NBA skill gap, everyone knows that it's notably very, you know, presumably large. Um, you know, a, the worst NBA team is going to take out the best college team in history. Okay, let's let's just say that right now. Take um, so, but when it comes to a summer league, a summer league team. Okay, these guys aren't NBA players. They're I would essentially say. They're closer to G League players. I, I wouldn't even say G League yet because then at that point they're getting a contract. But summer league players are fighting for an NBA spot and, you know, kind of a G League spot as well. So what would happen if a summer league team took on a top tier college squad? Okay, let's take everything that comes with it. The, co the coaching, the five-star recruits, everything with the college. Say Mike Krzyzewski's coaching um, and the summer league team it has not really, you know, an unnotable coach per se defensively i think the edge goes to a college squad that's why they live in di that's pretty much what they live and die off of uh the best defensive college squads always end up deep in the tournament okay if you take a look at texas tech a few years ago they came up with a kind of one three one style defense that got them deep into the tournament they lost against virginia but they you know they didn't have insanely good scorers uh baylor against gonzaga their defense was incredible no mostly because they were you know just built better um offensively you know in five on five situations a summer league player will probably have better iso scoring opportunities but the better team ball offensive strategy will go to a college team okay they're not you know fighting for anything they're you know playing as a team uh in summer league i see a lot of iso play um you know there's not as much team ball in a you know summer league matchup um so summer league players i would say they're just below G League player level, all these guys are fighting for a roster spot. Um, 
So a lot of these, you know, mid-tier college players will end up going to the summer league. So if you take a top-tier college squad and put them against a summer league squad, I think it kind of depends on who the players are. But I would say we'll go seven times out of ten. I think a top-tier college squad such as Duke, um, you know, and they're you know whoever's number one. I'd say let's say the number one team in the nation. Seven times out of ten, I'm going to take the college squad over the summer league. Okay, this is where the gap is hits the middle. I think more towards college though. Okay, um, I would say NBA skill gap. G League, kind of about seven-tenths of the way in. Summer League, about four-tenths of the way in. And then college, okay? Um, but, you know, all in all, I think Summer League players, they're all probably better. But at the same time, it's a, a lot of iso ball. It's a lot of fighting for a roster spot. You know, a college squad, it's built around, you know, defense. They live and die by it. Um, Five-on-five five situations, I'm, I'm going to take a top-tier college squad. I'm sorry. Um, I, I saw on the J.J. Reddick podcast, Duncan Robinson was discussing uh, whether he would take summer league or college. I would probably take um, – he, he said he would take a summer league team. I'm taking a college squad, okay? Um, just if we're talking top tier, it's very, it's very uh, situational. But if we're talking the coaching, the recruits, everything, um, I'm going to go with the college squad. And it's mostly coaching and mostly defense, um, but I think summer league is where that gap kind of dwindles to college and summer league. Yes, I know these guys are on the verge of the NBA, and I know they made it out of college and are fighting for a roster spot. But at the same time, if you take the coaching, the upcoming recruits that are getting better and better every day, look at Victor Wembenyama. Um so if those type of guys that are in college now, and we already know they're locked number one picks, I don't see why, you know, there's such a discussion about this skill gap. When we talk about NBA players, uh, I think summer league is a different discussion. So it's something to think about. I don't know. What do you think in the comments? Have a, have a blast in the comments today. Attack me about the Bears. Attack me about my summer league take. I don't care. We also have another kind of, you know, uh, situation going on in the NBA. Kevin Durant versus Adam Silver right now. Um, so Adam Silver made it known that he was not too happy with Kevin Durant requesting a trade. And I, I think it's I think it's very ironic and apropos how he's going to say this. And then, you know, the same guys in suits will essentially say it's business when guys get traded around left and right, you know, role players like that. Uh, so my thought is trades aren't good for the league only when the guys in suits don't want them to be okay executives will say a trade with the height of kevin durant's caliber is bad for the league and then we'll call up a role player who's been just traded and say you know it's a business they love to say it's a business whenever you know players get traded away they love to say it's a business but i'm completely on durant's side when it comes to this the nba only wants to be a business when they're tossing role players around like whores and not let others make their own decisions durant had the guts to one out and we'll start to see a new wave of this happening with superstar players you know i honestly think it's hypocrisy at its finest okay um you know it's it's a business why why can't it be a business on the nba players standpoint side and then when the guys, you know, the executives who call up the, you know, someone like Patrick Beverly. Let's talk about Patrick Beverly. He's been on numerous teams over his course of career. Um, you know, he's a role player, uh, but, you know, he gets tossed around, you know, traded around and whatnot. Uh, it's a business then. It's business. But when Kevin Durant requests a trade, it's bad for the league. I don't, it might be just be because of Durant's, you know, status and superstar status um but at the same time you know you can't decide when it's a business and when it isn't that's hypocrisy and stupid i'm sorry uh i think durant is making kind of a revolution we'll see maybe in the future if this is like a revolutionary thing for the the nba because i don't know if we're going to start to see a lot of superstar players like requesting out um uh, i think it'll happen more often but requesting trades out of you know um big deals like durant signed um a lot sooner than waiting the rest of their contract um yeah i really think it'll start a new wave of this happening with superstar players of them wanting out uh of, of them saying they want out and you know moves being made quicker let's just say that um yeah so it's fun it's just it's so hypocritical of adam silver to say you know it's bad for the league but you know players get 
traded when they love where they are all the time and they say it's a business that's my take on it i don't know and with our finale of the show Kyrie Irving let's talk about Kyrie Irving no one wants Kyrie well you know why is this let's talk um so Kyrie Irving left let's 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 go back to 2016 yeah that was 2016 um Kyrie Irving left Cleveland after the championship win he wanted to be his you know he wanted to have his own team he wanted to be his the superstar the number one guy he goes off to Boston Boston doesn't work out he joins up with Kevin Durant after, you know, I think he joins up with Kevin Durant after seeing multiple super team formations, such as LeBron with the Lakers and Anthony Davis, uh, Paul George and Kawhi Leonard, um, you know, Golden State essentially being a super team at that time, even though Durant left, but they were still pretty damn good. Um, you know, it was super team, super team, super team. It was a huge deal. So Kyrie, you know, came to his senses and said, I need to team up with someone. But I still think it was in the back of his mind to be the number one guy, okay? Most teams right now have found a guy to build around, and Kyrie is poised to be a number one option, unless if it's with another superstar like LeBron or KD. Uh, Kyrie has stated he wants to continue to play with KD, um, you know, or a trade happening to the Lakers with LeBron. LeBron wants this to happen. I don't see why Kyrie wouldn't want this to happen. Who also needs a number? Who needs a number two though? Let's talk. Let's talk about this. Luka Doncic. He needs a Robin. Luka Doncic needs his Clay Thompson. Luka Doncic needs someone who's poised to be that number two guy. Why wouldn't Kyrie work? Because Kyrie wants to be that number one guy. And, you know, th- most teams have found who that number one guy is going to be. We can even go as low as uh, the Rockets or the Pistons. We can talk about any of those bottom tier teams. Um, they have found their guy to build around. Cade Cunningham, Jalen Green. It's all been in the last few years as well. And if you trade for Kyrie, it'll completely mess up that rebuild. We saw what happened in Boston. Uh, he leaves. They excel. Luka needs that Clay Thompson to his Steph Curry. Okay, why am I connecting? Why am I jumping from point to point? Luka and Kyrie. I'm saying, Luka, the Mavericks need to find their number two guy and their elite. Kyrie needs to humble himself and accept the number two role. And he's not probably not going to do that. But if Luka and Kyrie get on the same team watch the f out um this will take a little bit of humbling from Kyrie, but here's my issue Kyrie won't step down to that level especially to luca who's younger i think Kyrie doesn't want to be that veteran uh you know guy that players you know can learn from i think he still wants to be his own player uh Kyrie won't be the number two vet it's not going to happen but if this does happen this is going to this will break the league luca would compliment Kyrie irving extremely well you thought Jalen Brunson played good most of that's due to Luka now he's on a 110 million dollar contract for five years with the Knicks um you know and this is essentially why Kyrie won't receive any play in the trade game besides with the Lakers is because he's not going to be that number two guy unless it's with LeBron or Kevin Durant but if he starts to think about Luka let me tell you that team is dangerous um you you know the Mavericks had a chance there against the Warriors. The Mavericks took out the Suns. They're one little superstar away from running with it. I'm serious. And Luka's going to have a few MVP seasons coming up, and it, it, it could be extremely dangerous. But Kyrie, humble yourself, be the Robin, and you'll win championships and earn contracts, and you won't be traded away. So um, it's all it's all subjective. We'll see if he wants to do that i don't know i think that would be perfect for dallas for Kyrie. i know it's kind of jumping from point to point but i came together i think and made sense anywho uh that'll do it for your podcast today thank you guys for watching i hope you enjoyed the friday special i hope you enjoyed hearing me rage over my uh homer rant about their bears um yeah this was a fun one this was controversial i love it thank you for watching the friday special and i'll see you guys next time peace